Professor George Chibayano from Hawaii University. And it is a pleasure for me to be here in order to replace my colleague, Manu Buko, who unfortunately was not able to attend. Professor Giorgi Cassiano from Marie Curie School of Science has now the floor. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for inviting me for this uh, conference. Uh, I knew about your organization, about uh, I knew about this university, so I, I knew where I go to. Um, I even took part in one of your uh, in, uh, NRS uh, events in 2015. So, uh, uh, so uh, it should not be confused. Uh, is it about microphone? Uh, louder? Yes. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Uh, should not, should not be confused. The, the, my position. I am working at Marie Curie Sklodowska University as a head of big uh, international project, which is about um, research of the politics of memory after 98 uh, in uh, at transnational level in Europe, at uh, the bilateral level uh, as a uh, relations in the sphere of politics of memory between several countries, and at the national level. So we have, uh, as an object of our study, we have transnational institutions, including ENRS, and uh, uh, we have national institutions like Institute of National Memory in different countries, and we have a uh, bilateral relations between uh, different, uh, different institutions and uh, political bodies in the sphere of the politics of memory. So I'm a Ukrainian scholar working in, in Poland since September 21. And I must admit that since 2010, I worked more in uh, international universities than in Ukraine, unfortunately. But I still work at, uh, in the in Ukrainian Academy and do my job at the Institute of Ukrainian History. So uh, my topic is about Russian-Ukrainian relations in the last 30 years. And uh, if you if we observe the the whole uh, history of these relations, we will we'll, we'll see that uh, they were never been uh, since uh, since 1991. They never been uh, let's say uh, normal in terms of of uh, international relations. So it's it's uh, endless chain of conflicts of uh, different kinds of uh, interactions uh, based on uh, controversies. Uh, memory wars, uh, custom wars, uh, political controversies, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, but it is not topic of my research. Topic of my uh, speech today is a, uh, our relations in the sphere of politics of memory and uh, history writing. I would like, with one very uh, basic point about uh, well, how history functions. So, uh, I believe that. Uh, History can function as a science, as a scholarship, as a, well, say, pure science. History also functions at, uh, at the level, uh, at the ideological level. It's so-called affirmative history. And we also have so-called didactical history, which is closely attached, intimately linked to uh, affirmative history. It's so-called didactical, which is, which can be expressed through famous formula, Historia Magistra Vita Est. And then listening to Gabar, I just uh, recalled another uh, expression by a German professor from, uh, uh, let's say, provincial German university, whose name was Hegel. He said that uh, we'll, uh, the lesson, major lesson of history is that we do not learn any lessons from history. So unfortunately, this is the case. And uh, uh, it's the case also in current situation, because if Russians, Russian policymakers and decision makers would know history and would learn history and would learn lessons from the history, we probably would live in a very different world. But now uh, we, uh, we, uh, we have a Caesar in history. We say before war, 
and after war. Months before the war, I published this book, it's Memory Crash, Politics of History in and Around Ukraine, 80s and uh, 2010s. And uh, some of the aspects of, uh, of this book uh, will be delivered today. And uh, this book is in, the, in, uh, in uh, free access at Muse Project. So every, everybody who wants to uh, read something about this uh, can uh, refer to this book. So I'm going back to the major topic of my lecture, which is Ukrainian-Russian relations in the field of politics of memory and how it uh, let, of course, it is easy when we are in the past time to say, well, that all happened and this is why we have this war. Uh, I am far away from that uh, point because uh, I don't believe that, uh, that we can rationally organize some kind of argument dealing with irrational motives in, in uh, action and in motivation. So uh, to a great extent, Together with rational, rational components, uh, Putin had very irrational arguments about uh, what he's doing and what he's going to do. And uh, I purely believe that uh, the idea of starting launching a large-scale war in Ukraine, in Ukrainian territories, that was uh, moved by irrational arguments. And now he and his entire entourage have to pay the price. Unfortunately, Ukraine also has to pay the price and the whole world has to pay the price. So how it started? I will give you first, I will give you a chronology, how these uh, relations about the past developed uh, between Ukraine and Russia. From the very beginning, from the very proclamation of Ukrainian independence on 24th of August, 1991, uh, Russian uh, ruling class started uh, what we then would call a war over history. And then press secretary of President Yeltsin, Pavel Vashanov, made a speech, uh, it was as far as I remember in, at the beginning of September, where he claimed that Ukraine, uh, that Russia recognizes independence of Ukraine. However, in this case, Russia feels it's right to uh, start discussions about borders. And he uh, mentioned three regions uh, in the post-Soviet space, this time yet Soviet space. It was Donbas, Crimea, and North Kazakhstan as territories which might be claimed by Ukraine. So from the very beginning, the issue was on the table. Uh, Ukraine did not react at this time uh, properly. and. Uh, Anyway, there was a kind of note about this. Uh, there were references to the, um, to the uh, document signed by Yeltsin and Kravchuk in 1990. Whatever it was, uh, well, the, the, from, from the very beginning, the intentions and the vision of Ukraine as something which should, should be subjugated to, to Russia and should follow Russians, uh, Russian politics was formulated. And I will tell you about this uh, later, what were the reasons, what were the most basic uh, reasons for that. Then in 1993-1994, Russian Duma uh, published several appeals uh, about Sebastopol and Crimea. And then uh, these appeals, uh, the content of these appeals was that uh, Sebastopol and Crimea are Russian territories. So it was 1993. And then immediately this year, since 93, 94, there was a real crisis in Ukrainian-Russian relations, particularly over Crimea. We were at the edge of the war, uh, exactly at this time, in Sebastopol. People, uh, well, the military forces were equipped to start this. Uh, so the, we were on the edge of military conflict. So then there were such agreements and then, uh, well, but still, in the minds of, uh, in the minds and uh, thoughts of uh, Russian policymakers, Crimea was Russian, and Ukraine was not real state. Uh, I would not uh, recall people like Lushkov, uh, mayor of Moscow, who did his escapades in, in uh, Ukraine many times. I, don't, I would not mean uh, the policy of bringing, uh, giving uh, Russian passports to. 
the population of Crimea in the end of 90s, uh, exactly after Ukrainian-Russian um, Ukrainian-Russian treaty was signed. So this is all not less about history. 2003, uh, there was a year of Russia in Ukraine. It was a, it is a cultural enterprise. It's a number of festivals, concerts, uh, literary readings, um, movie shows, etc., etc. It is from Soviet times. Came from Soviet times. It is Soviet tradition to have a year of uh, Soviet Republic in another Soviet Republic. However, this time in 2003, it was a year of Russia and Ukraine. It is exactly in this year, Kuchma published the book. President Kuchma published the book. And the title of the book was, uh, well, it speaks, uh, spoke for itself, Ukraine is not Russia. Kuchma was not original in this uh, statement, of course, because exactly 100 years before, in 1903, Ukrainian profession, professor uh, from uh, Lviv University, which was a part of Austro-Hungarian Empire this time, published an article about the a customary view on a Slavic history where he formulated exactly the same thing. His, uh, Ukraine is not Russia. So this history, had, there was a history of 100 years of knowing that Ukraine is not Russia, but uh, unfortunately, Russian uh, policymakers did not read this. But that was a statement. It was made in the year of Russia in Ukraine. It, this is why it was so important. Exactly at the same year, in 2003, there was a Tuzla crisis when Russia claimed part of uh, Ukrainian territory, so-called island Tuzla. They called this, uh, they called this a, uh, I don't remember, it was an island, some kind of striped Tuzla. So they, they said that it belongs to Russia. And then there was also a kind of military mobilization, and once again there was a there were grounds for territorial conflict. Then, uh, then there was a uh, Orange Revolution, and then Russia was uh, one of participants as a counter-revolutionary force, and uh, Russia lost there in this revolution. So Russia was not able to promote uh, their candidate, uh, Viktor Yanukovych. And then uh, you know that Yanukovych lives now in Moscow, and they brought him. <laughs> they brought him. They were going to bro bring him to Kiev after their victory in 22. I can't imagine what would happen to him if he would be there. So uh, anyway, uh, the Orange Revolution was a turning point in the politics of memory because in Ukraine the uh, um, new, uh, I would say, new stage of nationalization of history of making it, let's say, more Ukrainian, sometimes with real extremes, um, launched. And then that became a ground for the conflict with Russia, the history and the views on the past. I would say that starting from 2005, Russia got into the conflict with other neighbors, with Poland and with Baltic states, exactly about the past. So there was a, uh, a set of memory wars which uh, Russia uh, waged against their neighbors, against all those countries on, in the West, in European part, which had a shared history with Russia. In 2007, there was another event which uh, was not, uh, well, let's say, admitted as something remarkable, but it was a uh, creation of the organization which, whose name was Ruski Mir. So it, it was purely symbolical because uh, initially this organization was, a, let's say, a bit out of politics. It was like Alliance Francaise or um, British Council, or so the principles were the same: the dissemination of Russian culture and the uh, Russian uh, language in the world. However, uh, another organization was created, and the name of organization was Ros Satrudnichstvo. Uh, so Russian, uh, Russian cooperation. And this organization, together with Ruski Mir, started uh, what I call a cultural and ideological expansion of the idea of Russian word. Exactly in 2007, I, well, it, this is here in this uh, book. Exactly in 2007, Russian media, state-controlled media, started a massive campaign about Ukraine as a nest of radical nationalism. 
uh, presenting Ukrainians as a uh, idiotic nationalists who just uh, believe that they uh, dug out a Black Sea and that they uh, they are uh, well, seven thousand years old. Of course, we had this kind of uh, uh, writings in Ukraine written by. Uh, non-professional historians, it's so-called power history, but that was a major principle of Russian propaganda in media, is to present Ukrainians as uh, caveman nationalists, all Ukrainians, not just a small segment of uh, radical nationalists, but all Ukrainians. So that was the politics, and that politics was exactly about the past. Another thing is that um, Another challenge to Russia, which also uh, made a kind of investment into radicalization of Russia's foreign history politics, was extension of the European Union. So uh, the countries from the Eastern Europe, which uh, entered European Union and NATO, also promoted their own agenda about the past, particularly about the 20th century. And the uh, essentials of this agenda was that uh, Russia did not, Soviet Union did not liberate them from Nazis. The Soviet Union just brought them uh, another occupation. So these uh, countries started to present themselves as a victims of a double genocide or double occupation. And that was really a challenge to Russia because Russia exactly at this time, in 2005, started to create a uh, constitution, uh, constitutive myth about uh, Russia as a winner of in the Second World War and as a, as a liberator of Europe. There were two major points in this, in this myth, and these points were extremely important for Russia, first of all for, uh, for um, internal cohesion of, uh, of Russian society, presenting this victory as a uh, common uh, deed of all peoples of Russia, and second part, it was about positive image of Russia in the world uh, as a liberator of Europe from Nazis. And this, of course, contradicted with the presentation of the same past by Eastern European nations who believed that it was not liberation, but was another occupation. So um, in 2009, Russia, uh, in Medvedev, President Medvedev, uh, called a uh, special commission the name of commission was uh, Commission of Historians for Combating Attempts of Falsification of History, which aimed at making harm to Russia. So the commission had to work uh, outside Russia and bringing people to judgment, those people who were going supposedly to make harm to Russia, writing history. And that was this expansionist element of the politics of memory in Russia, which was particularly visible in Ukraine. Rossotrudnichestvo, Ruski Mir, 90 Russian TV channels in Ukraine, all promoted Russian agenda in history, particularly on the Second World War. So uh, that worked. That certain extent that worked, and then Ukraine did not have conflict with Russia outside Ukraine on the on the past, but also had a conflict with Russia inside Ukraine because Russian institutions, like uh, like um, for instance another institution, Institute of the Commonwealth of Independent States, also launched their activities in Ukraine promoting Russian historical narrative in which Ukraine was not presented at all. So. Um, then uh, I'm going, the second part of this uh, chronology is what, uh, what were the major points of discord between Ukraine and Russia in these discussions. First of all, it was Kyiv and Rus. Russians believed that it is part of Russian proper. Ukrainians rightly believed and still believe that it was a beginnings of Ukrainian statehood. So then uh, Kozak state and Pereyaslav Treaty of 1654. It was in Russia. It was about uh, reunification of Ukrainians and Russians. In Ukraine, it was about a treaty between uh, suzerain uh, between Moscow Tsar and Cossacks. Uh, Konotop battle, battle of 1659. For Russians, it was a tragedy 
uh, and uh, kind of civil war uh, within Russia. For Ukrainians, it was great victory over Russian troops in, in, in 17. Of course, uh, it, it's, it's, it's all about uh, anachronisms uh, in terms of uh, history writing, but anyway, it was there. Then, of course, Mazepa, Hetman Mazepa, uh, who was blasphemed by the Russian Orthodox Church in uh, 18th century, and he's still under blasphemy, by the way. And uh, uh, in Ukraine, he was uh, presented, of course, as a nation builder in 18th century, and uh, uh, 10 hryvnia uh, banknote uh, holds the image of Mazepa. So uh, the Ukrainian Revolution of 1720, for Russians, it was part of big Russian revolutions, a revolution, as well as to the major, uh, m majority of researchers in the West. For Ukrainians, it was Ukrainian revolution. Moreover, it was not just Ukrainian revolution, it was a battle, it was war against Russia. Russia was presented as occupier and as aggressor. And then later it was transformed into the idea of 100 years of war between Ukraine and Russia, of course, at the level of affirmative history. So, uh, and of course, the great famine of 32-33, Russians uh, stated, including official historians, stated that it was a uh, famine uh, which affected the whole uh, territory of the Soviet Union, Ukrainians insisted that it was an act of genocide against Ukrainian nation. And finally, we have a World War II and the Ukrainian National Movement, organization of Ukrainian nationalists and Ukrainian insurgent army. To Russians, they were absolute collaborators with Nazis. For Ukrainians, at least for part of Ukrainians, they were fighters for independence. So, uh, 2008 is a turning point in these uh, relations and in, this, uh, uh, in, in the launch of the memory wars. In 2008, Putin, the prime minister of Russia at this time, being at the summit, Bucare summit at Bucharest in this country, um, formulated several basic theses which are now on the table and which are uh, were always uh, promoted at different public spaces. So first, first the thesis, Russians, uh, Russians in Ukraine. So Putin cared about 17 million Russians in Ukraine and said that they are uh, those who belong to Ukraine, the concept of compatriots in the near abroad. Expansionist companies, this kind of uh, uh, irredentist nationalism, uh, which was absolutely impossible within Russia but which was taken as a strategy outside Russia. Then uh, historical Russian lands transferred to Ukraine. This thesis first was formulated in 2008. So, uh, and then the first time when this term uh, was uh, formulated, historical south of Russia. Look at the map of, Ukraine, of Russian offensive now, you will see what it is about, which was then, by the way, this, uh, this thesis about historical south of Russia was then transferred into the politics and the attempt to establish so-called Novorossiya in, uh, in Ukraine and in 2015. They even, uh, they even uh, created a parliament of Novorossiya uh, in 2015 with Oleg Tsarev on, uh, as a head. Uh, and then it, this, this project was suspended, and now, as you see, it is again, uh, it is back again. And then uh, this time also Putin mentioned that Ukraine was composed of, other, of lands of other countries, Poland, Romania, and Czechoslovakia, all formulated in 2008, and all contextualized with the expansion of NATO. Putin warned NATO that in the, in the case of expansion eastward, then there will be problems, and he formulated this time that there will be threat to the uh, statehood of Ukraine. So uh, then in 2013, uh, Putin, in his uh, interview to Associated Press Agency, repeated the idea that Ukrainians and Russians are one people. In 2014, 2015, 2016, Again, he publicly mentioned the um, uh, historical lens of uh, his historical south of Russia, and um, of course Crimea. Well, since 2014, Crimea 
was mentioned many times publicly as a historical Russian land, and the annexation of Crimea was presented in terms of restoration of historical justice. It is absolutely, it is a, uh, well, the, this his, historical justice for any professional historians, historian, it should be a red light. And finally, in July 21, he wrote his famous or unfamous article uh, on the historical unity of Russians and Ukrainians. And on 21st of February, he delivered his speech, 56 minutes speech dedicated to the uh, uh, to DNR and LNR, two proxy states created by Russia, and then three days later the war started. So I'm going to uh, make some generalizations after this. First of all, I will describe the basics of historical outlook of Putin and Russia's ruling class. I would like to make a note, when I'm talking about this, when I make these formulations, which became a precondition for war, uh, I talk about Putin, about political class in Ukraine, about large majority of cultural elites. But if we talk about professional historians, you'll find a lot of them who are disagree with this and who recognize Ukraine as separate entity and Ukrainians. So first point number one, Russian ruling class and majority of it did not perceive and do not uh, did not perceive until now uh, Ukrainians as the other from capital O. Ukrainians were not others. They were uh, part of historical Russian body, like hand or in leg or whatever. So when this part tries to separate, it is a kind of threat which is considered in very uh, negative terms. Second, this view that Ukrainians are not others, that they are Russians or little Russians. Uh, so they are Russians. This view emerged at the doctrinal level at the second half of 19th century, exactly at the time when imperial uh, consciousness of, Russian in of Russians was formed. It is, it is really important to understand that uh, the historical identity of Russians political identity of Russians, what, whoever they are in, 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 in terms of ethnicity. So their identity as Russians was formed before their national identity as Russians was formed. So that was imperial identity or transnational identity, supranational identity, which was not national. And it occurred exactly at the era of this process finalized exactly at the, pro, at the period of uh, nationalism in the second half of 19th century. So uh, at exactly at this time, in the second half of 19th century, Ukrainian elites started their project, which, well, in, in instrumental terms, the project of national revival, and which resulted finally in the revolution and, revolution and in um, creating national state in 1917-1920. So then, according to this view that Ukrainians are not Ukrainians, that they are Russians. Uh, Ukrainians, according to this view, uh, view, are unable to form their own statehood and can, cannot successfully exist independently. They can, be, can exist only as a part of a greater Russian people, which is transnational. Ukrainians never existed, the next point, never existed sovereign actor of history. Always, they always existed either as a part of Russian history and Russian history, you know, it is about Historia Gesudarstva Rosyskova, history of the Russian state. It is purely statist narrative. So, uh, and uh, they could exist as a part of Russian state, which was good, or as a part of other states, which was bad. So if Ukrainians were part of Polish state, that was bad. If they would be part of Austrian state, that was bad. And to be a part of Russian state, it was really good. So uh, Ukrainians' claims for sovereignty is not a result of, of their intrinsic internal development. It's not their wish or result, at desire. It is either the result, a result of ill-minded intellectuals who invented some kind of Ukraine, or an outcome of external anti-Russian intrigue. In 19th century, it was Polish intrigue. In the end of 19th century, beginning of 20th century, it was German intrigue. 
now uh, Austrian intrigue, then it was German intrigue, and finally now it is European Union intrigue and United States intrigue. So external force, uh, which uh, well, wants to kill Russia, that's, that's this external turn uh, force, provoke Ukrainians to insist on their, uh, on their uh, separateness. Next point, Russia belongs neither to Europe. Russia belongs neither to Europe, which is corrupted by rationalism, not, nor to the East. It has own historical de destiny and special historical path. So Russians still insist on the thing which in German called Zonderweg. And uh, we know which uh, country also insisted on certain Zonderweg and certain mission in 20th century. And we know what was the result of this. So Russia opposes the West uh, with their own Zonderweg now. And finally, Russia ha has special rights on adjacent territories, on the former imperial periphery. So special position, Ukraine to them is a kind of backyard. They have this is our territory, this is us. It's not others, they're us. So we have special rights here. And by the way, this also, these claims can be extended to the Eastern Poland or to Alaska. Why not? Alaska was said, sold just for $6 million. It's, it's nothing. So let's take it back. And then Ukraine. What's, what's about Ukraine? Ukraine, on the opposite to Russian view, uh, presents itself as a sovereign agent of history, and sovereign, uh, sovereign actor of history, which exists for more than thousands of years. Again, I speak about political history, yeah? the ideological history. I don't speak about <laughs> professional history now. So it is a Ukrainian point of view. Ukraine is a sovereign actor of history which exists for more than 1,000 years. Russia is the other. This is the most important point. Russia is the other, and Russia, moreover, is a const constitutive other. Ukraine is not Russia. That was the title of the book. So this motto can, motto can be applied to the whole Ukrainian history, particularly since 18th century. Ukraine is not Russia. Ukraine is not Russia. This is how Ukrainians formed their own historical image and representations. Ukraine belongs to Europe. This is another important point. Ukraine does not claim any special role uh, apart from being a unique European cultural and political entity. Finally, Ukraine is a bridge between East and West, so it does not confront with East and the West, except with Russia. And Ukraine now, well, another, another line became pretty obvious, which was packed within historiography narrative. Ukraine is a barrier of Europe. Now it is actively explored, exploited by uh, Ukrainians that we are barrier we defending Europe from the uh, from Russia. So I'm going to my very final point. Uh, it is about uh, the, the, the very essence of the conflict. We see that we have two absolutely uh, opposite uh, visions of the past, of the shared past, Russian and Ukraine. They are opposite. They cannot. They can coexist, but when they exist in parallel spaces. When they meet, then we have a conflict. There were reconciliation uh, attempts, but, uh, well, generally, they were uh, fruitless. I, for instance, was a member of Ukrainian-Russian Commission of Historians, and that really, was a really interesting experience. So uh, conflict of the, of, over the shared past. It is my phone. I'm sorry, I cannot reach it and uh, let, uh, let, let it expire at a certain point. So conflict over the shared past is a manifestation of the conflict of two opposite historical narratives and two opposite forms of identity. I'm, I'm uh, going to find a point. And it is, Go ahead. Go ahead. it is important to understand that this conflict is not just about past. It's not just about uh, representations. It's not just about academic versions of the past. It is, it reaches existential level. So one identity, Russian identity, does not recognize the right to exist uh, of another identity, of Ukrainian identity. Just no. 
if you observe Ukrainian, uh, if you observe Russian textbooks of history, school textbooks, you will not find there uh, Ukraine. Few, few notions. No, no, no Ukraine there. Historia государства Российского, yes. No Ukraine, no Ukrainians. Probably after 91, you can find word Ukrainians. So that next is the part does not exist. And this is about the outlook. It is not about just uh, speculations, manipulations, formulations. It is about outlook. It's something about really intrinsic, the worldview. And according to this, Russia, a loss of Ukraine is a loss of historical Russia. In literary terms, finally, for Ukrainians, uh, this historical Russia becomes an existential threat. That was formulated mostly by, uh, let's say, right conservatives and extreme rights in Ukraine in, to speak about this politically. But now Russia decided to uh, prove this uh, thesis that Russia is existential threat and then what would be, what, what, whatever would be the outcome of this uh, uh, conflict, of this war, uh, all can be said with a uh, good level of uh, understanding the situation and uh, that uh, after that war, Russia and Ukraine will never be for, uh, together. Like it was formulated in 16, in, in 1954, forever together when there was a, uh, uh, the anniversary of uh, Periasla Treaty. So after 2022, it is very hard, hard, hardly possible that Ukraine and Russia would be uh, together. And probably it is also real end of historical Russia and real uh, new, new beginning of the history. I truly believe that history of Ukraine in 2022 starts a very new history of Ukraine, including understanding of the past. I don't know whether it's not optimistic or pessimistic or neutral. At this point, I would like to stop and uh, to, uh, to go to discussion. Thank you very much for your attention. Ladies and gentlemen, we just listened to an excellent conference uh, contribution under the title of History as a Kazakh's Baby, the historical roots of the Russian war against Ukraine, presented by Professor Yuri Kassian. Thank you. Thank you. I shall uh, I'd like to tell you all that uh, this Discussions and uh, questions, comments will be addressed to all the ones who will speak this afternoon at the end. After all, uh, the contributions will be presented. Thank you. Our please to Please. I'm told from the public. Yes, I, I heard this. <laughs> yeah. There yeah. will be comments and yeah. Yes, please. Yeah, thank you. Please. Who? Thank you very much. For Mrs. This excellent presentation. I've enjoyed it very much. And um, there is one question uh, which you didn't uh, plan to address, but which I saw. It would be interesting you to introduce into this uh, duo uh, to transform it into a triangle. Because uh, what do you think was your position of the West, of the Western countries, for instance, of, about the Americans who we remember a famous speech in Kiev, mm -hmm. uh, the chicken speech, mm -hmm. if I remember well. Uh, could you sort of elaborate a little bit on this third part of, mm -hmm. of the situation? Thank you. That's, uh, well, it, it, it it does not apply to historical uh, perspective in terms of uh, of, of historical uh, of, of writing or interpreting history, but uh, well, to a certain extent, it is also a part of uh, general vision of uh, 
of uh, of today's events and of how they connected to the past. And Ukraine already has its uh, past as an independent country. It's uh, 30 years. So that's uh, you have mentioned chicken speech, uh, chicken Kiev speech, uh, which was extremely negatively perceived in Ukraine by by all, by public, by politicians, etc. So, but that was that time. It was. I think that this chicken Kiev speech was a launch at the beginning of uh, the politics, which was uh, which was about appeasing uh, Russia. And that uh, that that uh, politics resulted in uh, what's happening now. So uh, there is a formula not to, not to appease, but to consider. So that. That should be considered at the very beginning, at uh, the very beginning, at Chicken Kiev speech, Vashanov's statement, then all this nervous uh, history of Ukrainian-Russian relations of uh, 30 years, which, uh, well, to, with a greater share of inevitability, led to the conflict not just before between Ukraine and Russia, but between, uh, let's say, West and Russia, and Ukraine became a battlefield in this conflict. So um, this means that, uh, unfortunately, Ukraine uh, found itself in the epicenter. And I, I understand the, uh, the hidden agenda in your question. I believe that it is about the role of the West in the, as a kind of treachery uh, role of the West. Unfortunately, yes, that was uh, it, it, it had it took 30 years. And by this moment, uh, 10 million refugees to, uh, to get understanding that Ukraine is a part of Europe. Ukraine is a, uh, well, is a country which deserves more attention, not uh, in terms of patrimony and in ter- not in terms of giving uh, something like, not in terms of kind of post-colonial perspective. No, in terms of uh, understanding that, uh, that <laughs> Ukraine is not Russia. <laughs> Very simple formula. Uh, but uh, the, the, I lived there for all my life. So since I was one, I, I was brought there from Russia to Ukraine. So, and I know this country very well from inside. And uh, I, I visited Russia until 1993. And uh, I, I can say you that, uh, yes, that really different countries, really different cultures, really different identities. A lot of similarities, it's true. If it goes about anarchy, corruption, etc., a lot of similarities. But when it goes about uh, about some kind of positive stance, these are these countries are really different, and they uh, and it's absolutely virtually impossible to uh, to imagine the situation when Russia absorbs Ukraine as a uh, as a separate entity. So uh, and uh, finalizing this the history of the West and uh, attitude of the West, well, some some things are uh, coming in the right time. Yeah, so this understanding of Ukraine did not come in the right time. Of course, Ukrainians also uh, share some responsibility for this uh, with uh, their inconsistency in reforms, in uh, in many uh, cultural things, etc. But uh, nevertheless, uh, <laughs> nobody is perfect like it was said in one movie. So uh, uh, Ukraine, with all its imperfectness, with all its, uh, uh, let's say, Slavic anarchism, with all its uh, very va- various uh, attitudes to various things, it is European country. And uh, even at the level of, uh, let's say, everyday life, when i uh, visiting different countries, I lack some real, some services which make my life in Ukraine so much comfortable and which are absent in other uh, parts of Europe. Other okay. questions and uh, perhaps comments? I only want to add the detail, if it could be considered as a detail, the fact that uh, the Russians a tradition to try to not accept the ethnicity of different people. Mm-hmm. Of, for example, the Romanian Symbasoid. Mm-hmm. 
mm -hmm. uh, two Russians, the ones in the Serbia, the present day um, Moldavian Republic, are not Romanians. And the language they speak mm -hmm. is Moldavian, is not Romanian. Mm -hmm. So, and they did it many a time. They have a tradition in doing that. Mm -hmm. Looking at the way they pronounce the names of the ones coming from different former Soviet Republic. Mm -hmm. uh, let us take the example of the Chechen, how is Bagiro? Mm -hmm. That one, his name is Bagir, I, I suppose. Yeah, sure. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, this is something where and when the Russians always did. Mm -hmm. If you accept. Well, I accept. You, you must know better than me. I accept because uh, the, grand, the name of my grandfather was Kasyan. And then when he was four years old, uh, they his family moved to uh, Russia from Poltava region. Well, that was Russian Empire, but they moved to uh, Ural, uh, to, to, <laughs> to North Kazakhstan <laughs> for the land. They were peasants. And then there he became Kasyanov. Well, they do not recognize the ethnicity of different people. Oh, that's... People of their nations, different nations. But, please. Uh, you mentioned at the end of your paper, almost in passing, that uh, Russia is uh, um, yeah, other, or Ukraine, Ukraine, uh, is uh, uh, Russia is a constituent of Ukraine. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, what in or about Russia is Ukraine constituent? Uh, I didn't get you. You asking about Russian Ukrainians? You said that Russia is the other for Ukraine. Yes. At the end, a, a constituent of. Yes. So, in what 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 is a constituent of? Ah. Uh -huh. Okay, that's, uh, that's uh, yes, that's a great question. It's uh, constitutive is that uh, when I mean constitutive other, when I say this, uh, I mean that uh, Russia is important other to form Ukrainians own identity. So on the opposite. So the, the major formula is Ukraine is not Russia, which means that here in the head, this Russia exists and we have to prove that we are not them. So that this the, the formula. This is why I call Russia constitutive other. Ukrainians do not think about themselves that we are not Poles. They do not think about themselves that we are not Romanians or Bulgarians, but they think about themselves as are not Russians. But that's a negative conception of Absolutely. the constitution. So is there a positive sense in which it's constitutive? Yeah, sure. Well, a lot of, uh, for instance, uh, well, I don't know how to call it positive because uh, Ukrainians, uh, you know, it's we, we have to apply some kind of long durée uh, in understanding the identity. Mm -hmm. And Ukraine developed uh, for a long time of its history, developed as a frontier society. So a frontier society means that you do not recognize state or some kind of external force as a something which, uh, which you should follow. Yeah. So, uh, and this is exactly about Ukrainians. They, uh, they have a state, and in 2019, the, uh, level of, um, the level of trust to state institutions in 2019, according to Gallup, was 9%. 9% of Ukrainians uh, believe, uh, trusted state institutions in Ukraine. So the question is how the society, we're 9%, uh, and it's, it's, uh, uh, it corresponds to sociological reviews in Ukraine itself. So uh, two institutions were of the highest level of trust in, in Ukraine, army and church. Or the Pardon? Or the like in Romania. Yeah, yeah, but I'm sure. Yeah, so it's, we are in the region. So uh, the, the, uh, how it comes that uh, this country opposes huge Russian forces? And the, the answer is in the uh, civil society, in horizontal structures. 
So being for centuries a uh, uh, frontier society, Ukrainians accustomed to kind of horizontal self-organization. If you look at the history after 2014, well, I saw this myself. I visited a uh, eastern uh, eastern Ukraine during the conflict with the uh, volunteers delivering there uh, some medicine. So uh, I saw this. This is horizontally organized society, which uh, where, where people help each other, uh, so, and they can do this on on the on the regular basis. Another interesting thing is that. Uh, you mentioned that it's negative uh, constitution, uh, and it's correct. Another part of this negative constitutive uh, identity is that uh, Ukrainians are better uh, readily organized against something, against oppression, against bad government, etc., etc., than for something. So, and this is this will be great picture uh, question mark uh, after the world will be over. Now, we know what the Russian politician Putin and other ones around here think about the Ukrainian as a people. What about the Russian people? What do they think about that? Do they think, think as well that the Ukrainian are not are, are Russian? Yeah, that's, good. that's very good point. Uh, unfortunately... Uh... I'm sorry, because... That would explain mm -hmm. if the Russians, as a people, approve of the war. Mm -hmm. In fact, well, uh, this long story, uh, including personal uh, story, I I have relatives in Russia. I lost links to them uh, after 24th of February. I wrote them, I short messages in the Facebook. I wrote, he kills us. Let him be cursed, something like this. Uh, so, um, and they didn't respond. Uh, I don't know what's going on with them, but they are in the far in the heartland of Russia. Uh, so, uh, I well, I I had this uh, personal exper experience when I spoke to my relatives in 1993. They asked me, "Why do you need it? Why you don't want to live?" together with us. I told them, I, I'm ready to live together with you, but uh, I, I want to live in my country and have a, uh, well, visit you, you visit me, and et cetera, et cetera. Why should we be in one country, one government, etc.? We want to have our government. We, have, we want to make our own mistakes. We want to, uh, well, to uh, do what we do without somebody from outside who would uh, tell us what to do. And, uh, well, they even used, you know, they used the word chachli, and they called me chachol, uh, uh, not in pejorative terms. They just say that, well, chachol, is a, a, bit, a, a bit crazy. So, uh, but if, uh, if we talk about big data, for instance, it is uh, almost impenetrable. It is, it is really hard to... Uh, to find out what is real attitude, because uh, uh, official uh, official sociology uh, asks about attitudes. They are not asking. They are not asking about. Do you believe that Ukrainians are other? They are asking what, how you, uh, what is your attitude to Ukrainians? Positive, negative, neutral. This is how they ask. Uh, probably there might be, uh, probably I don't have access to this, but probably there were kind of deep interview, focus group interviews, etc., where you can find this is quality. But uh, I, I dealt only with the quantity sociology, and uh, I do not have data. Initially, uh, so, sorry, intuitively, I can say that uh, they, not just elites, not just cultural elites, but ordinary people, do not have a sense uh, that Ukrainians are really others, but now after this war they do. Yeah. They do. That they met. Why, that is why uh, I asked the question I addressed mm -hmm. a moment ago. Yeah, sure. My dears, other questions, comments? Just, another, just a comment about what the. Uh, 
regarding the constitutional part, I think, it emerged like a defense mechanism, I guess, for Ukrainians. Mm -hmm. Uh, defense uh, in, in opposing the... Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. It's uh, psychologically, yes, it is. Uh, well, they, you know, if you observe the writings of Ukrainian intellectuals from the beginning of uh, 20th century, or more interesting, the travelogues written by Russians traveling through Ukraine, which, which is now Ukraine, it's really interesting that, uh, in fact, when uh, Russian travelers and their educated people yeah, because, uh, well, who, would, who could travel and write travelogues? They understand Ukraine, Malorossia, Little Russia, as different country. So it is something different. Culturally, uh, the food, uh, the outfits, the, well, the language, strange language. So it's, it's different. It is, it is real, it's real kind of internal contradiction in, in this psycho. But the major point here is that they are ready to, uh, to accept the fact that even that Ukrainians have different language, they have different dances, they have the same embroidery shirts, uh, they have some, well, some probably different character, but it is just a ethnographic ramification of Russians. So we can recognize you as the other as a little Ukrainians, a little Russians. You are a bit different, but we are part of us. And uh, uh, so... It's a consequence from a political narrative. Exactly, exactly, yes. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Now, uh, my dear ones, it is a pleasure for me to announce the topic. <laughs> okay.